you all made it here safely. I'm glad you're feeling better. So Island's been laid up as well. And with it, and I've been sleeping in the living room. My wife has been dealing with the flu uh, the last week or so, and so I've been very I've gotten acquainted with my couch <laughs> as I have been avoiding the flu. And I'm um, thankful the Lord has blessed uh, my efforts. And uh, looking forward to our presentation tonight. You know, I just want to share with you. Uh, You know, I, I have looked forward to the coming of Christ since I've given my life to Jesus in my 20s. But I can tell you that the events transpiring around the world are uh, indicating to us very clearly that the coming of Christ is very near. We're going to be studying that in our presentation here in the days ahead. It was very interesting. As many of you know, I, I had a funeral Thursday. I did the presentation, I had to jump in my car early Friday morning and race down to Wilmington uh, for a funeral. And I was uh, talking to the funeral director, just getting things lined up, you know, for the, the, the service. And this lady, of course, this is her business, and she has done this for many years, and suddenly she just stuck, spun around and looked at me and she said, Pastor, she said, something's happening. I said, what do you mean? She says, we have had an uptick in deaths, and I cannot, I have never seen this. Are you experiencing that up in your area? And I know that I have been averaging a funeral a month. I mean, I've been a pastor a long time. I have not had that experience. And, and the point is, things are happening in the world that are indicating to us that the coming of Christ is very near. And um, this is, this is a t if there ever was a time to draw closer to our Savior, it is now. Uh, the Lord is ready. We need to be ready. Anyway, we'll talk, talk more about that. Um, I do want to get into this presentation. It's a very important one. Before we do, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to have a little bit of a review. Everybody have their lesson? Good to have you with us. And I know you're somehow you're connected to Rita. I went to school with your daughter. Oh, okay. I knew there was a connection. And your first name? Scott. Scott. Pleasure. Good to have you with us. And, uh, well, I'm going to begin with a word of prayer. I'm going to kneel, and I'm going to ask you all if uh, you'll bow your hands. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this evening, really in the shadow of amazing events that are transpiring in our world. We're watching it unravel. Father, we have no human solution for the things that are happening to our societies all around the world. You are our only solution. And Lord, it, it's studies like these that we're doing that are informing us of where we are in the stream of time. It is your word that prepares us, Father, to know you as our great Savior, our Creator God, but also, Lord, to be ready to go home with you soon. Father in heaven, we ask for your presence to be here. You are our teacher. It's not me. It's you. And you remind us that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So we pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us. Everyone in this room is at a different place in life, and each one needs something special, and I just pray that you will provide it for them. <coughs> there are others that are yet coming. I pray you grant them traveling mercies. Thank you, Lord, so much for your goodness, for a love that just wouldn't let us go. And so, Lord, I pray you'll hide this humble instrument behind the cross, Amen. that it'll be only Jesus that will be seen, heard, and felt. Please, come into our midst, not because we deserve it, we don't, and we never will, but because you are loving and merciful and gracious. And we ask for the blood of Jesus to wash away our sin and his righteousness to cover us now. And may your angels, that excel in strength, present about us now today, this evening, a ring of fire to protect us and to keep us focused. Lord, this is a lot of information. Give me wisdom. Touch my lips. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 We are really focusing in on the Day of Atonement. We studied uh, the Jewish Day of Atonement. We talked about how the Day of Atonement, the sins that have been transferred to the sanctuary throughout the year, were then dealt with. And we're learning that the Day of Atonement 
Israel understood the Day of Atonement to be uh, symbolic of the Day of Judgment. And uh, so we are going to be looking at what the Bible has to say about the judgment. I want to share something with you. I've been a pastor now for over, for about 20 years. I've been a Bible student for much longer. I have never heard anyone ever preach on the judgment. I've heard references to it, but not the mechanics of how it works. We're going to look at the actual mechanics of what the Bible says, how the judgment works. And what you're going to find, you know, a lot of people are very much afraid of the judgment when they study it because it's based out of, out of ignorance, really. Um, God is not the one to fear. The Father is not the one to fear in the judgment. There is something to fear, though, and it's not Him. We're going to find out what that is, the real fear factor. And uh, you're going to be encouraged when you see that. Uh, you're going to find God is very logical. He's very reasonable. But before we get there, we're going to be looking tonight at a prophecy that actually reveals the starting point of the judgment. And uh, this really is, uh, it tells me a lot about God that he wants us to be aware of where we are in the stream of time and what he's doing for us. He wants us to engage, and, and, and it's really important to recognize that God needs our attention, our attention during the judgment process. And we'll learn about that some more as we go along. Now in our last presentation we looked at uh, Daniel chapter 2 which revealed the rise and fall of the nations. Uh, his, we, we, Daniel looked at history before it happened and we're looking back at it after it happened. And we just marvel at the accuracy of God's understanding of the future because he knows the future. He doesn't guess at the future. So I'm going to give you a quick quiz. The first, we're going to look at the medals. Uh, in, the, in the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, the head was made of gold. The, the arms and the chest was made of gold. Uh, the hips were made of Grass. the legs were made out of iron. And the feet were made out of iron. Okay, very good. The head represented the, the, the silver represented uh, the brass represented the legs represented represented Rome, Rome, and the feet represented Rome. The, the dividing of Europe, right? And so Daniel was the head of gold looking down through time, and we are at the toes looking back. And we know the next scene is the coming of Christ. Okay, so that was our quick quiz. So Daniel 2 lays the foundation for our presentation tonight, and another one in the future, numbers uh, 15. This is an amazing, amazing prophecy. And for uh, one of the, the series, right now we're doing a series on the sanctuary, but I like to do a workshop on the book of Daniel. Uh, and Daniel uh, has uh, one, two, three, four, four prophecies related to time. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, 8 and 9, I consider one, 10 and 11, uh, I consider another. And all of them cover the same ground. It's just that each time it's repeated, God reveals more detail. Are you with me? So Daniel 2, it laid down uh, the foundation. And we're going to be looking at, uh, at 8 and, uh, and, and going into 9. And, and that's going to build on what we already learned. So you're gonna, we're going to begin with a little bit of a review. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and so again, we're looking at the longest time prophecy uh, in the Bible. Now, stay with me. We're going to be moving through this pretty quickly. You're going to feel like you're taking a drink out of a fire hydrant. But I have been, we've prayed and we asked God to, to help your mind and my mouth, didn't we? So if you walk out of here and you understand it, don't thank the preacher. Thank God. Very, very important. So let's get started. Uh, on the, uh, this is part two of Cleansing the Heavenly Sanctuary. And let's get into our first question, Daniel, uh, uh, in the book of Daniel, chapter 8. The question is, Daniel had an amazing vision uh, in which he saw a ram with two horns. Whom does this ram represent? Now remember, we need to let the Bible define itself. Isn't that true? The Bible tells us. So Daniel sees this vision of this ram. What does it represent? And the angel tells him uh, what it represents. Let me back up here. He says, the ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of whom? Yeah. Medea and Persia. This is very interesting because in Daniel chapter 2, when he begins uh, his vision, the definition, it began with which nation? With Babylon. Right now, Belshazzar is the, is the king, okay? 
And instead of beginning with Babylon, it's now beginning, his vision begins with Medo Persia. Why? They who invaded. What's that? They invaded Babylon. Yeah, because Babylon is about to pass. The scene is about to pass from the scene. So it begins with Medo Persia. What follows? Let's take a look. Question number two. Oh, wait, here's. Uh, and then Medo Persia rules from 539 to 331 BC. We talked about that. But keep track. Just to get an idea of those numbers, because we're going to revisit that. Like, you can look at that and say, that's about 200 years. Okay. Uh, question number two. Uh, Daniel next saw a goat with a great horn between his eyes. What does this mean? Daniel 8, 21 and 22 says, The male goat is the kingdom of who? Greece. Of Greece. The large horn that is between the eyes is the what? The first king. The first king. As for the broken horn and the what? The four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. Okay? So God is starting to, he's starting to flesh out, giving us a little bit more detail. Are you noticing that the nations are coming in the same order as Daniel 2? You're catching that. Very significant. But more detail. Now this horn is mentioned. So there's, it comes up with one horn, and then it breaks off, and then four horns come out of that. If you have any knowledge of history... Who was the great ruler, the great king of Greece? Yes. Alexander the Great, right? Okay, and uh, Alexander the Great in four years conquers the then no world. No one has been able to achieve that even in modern history. He had a very swift moving military, cavalry based. Uh, he used a very unique tactic. He used a wedge shape attack against the enemies. They used to just kind of line up and go at it. But instead he'd go in as a wedge. And you know the old adage, divide and conquer. He often went up against superior forces. For example, the Battle of Arbella, he went up against the Medes and the Persians who had 100, I mean, the, yeah, Medes and the Persians who had 128,000 men. He went at them with, with 36,000 and defeated them. His men never lost a battle. And remember in the vision, the, Greek, the, the goat was moving and his feet were not touching the? Yeah. Implying what? Speed. Speed. Quick conquest. Isn't that interesting? How, uh, how history actually confirms the vision uh, long before the history actually took place. And so anyway, when Alexander dies, there's civil war. Uh, the generals are all battling for uh, real estate. And four generals emerge as uh, dominant figures. One is Ptolemy. The other is Lysimachus. The other is Cassander and Seleucus. Now, I'm not spending a lot of time on this. If you want these notes, you can come to me. But uh, Ptolemy, you might remember, who does he end up ruling? Egypt. Egypt, very good. Does anyone remember who was the, I'm testing your, your history, who was the last Ptolemy ruler? Cleopatra. You got it. Cleopatra was the last one. Uh, the Simicus uh, would rule thrice, Cassander would rule Macedonia, and Seleucus, Syria. And so the text here says um, that the four stood in the place of the one, but the four kingdoms shall not arise out of that nation, and not with it. they should rise but not have the same power. So those four kings never were able to combine uh, the, 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 the territory that um, Alexander had conquered. You with me? They never reached the same level. They're all about the same strength, and so it just kept them all at bay, and four nations emerged. So, what comes out, what follows then? So far we're looking at a review, right? So 331 to 168 uh, BC, so we're looking at about 140 years that uh, Greece would rule. So let's take a look at number three. What does Daniel see coming out of, of one of the four winds of heaven? What power uh, does this little horn represent? Daniel 8 verse 9 says, And out of one of them, the, the winds, came a what? A little horn. And a horn, by the way, in Bible prophecy represents a power. Okay? Strength, power. Which grew exceedingly great. Okay, that's very significant. It grew exceedingly great from being what? Little. From being little. Does that make sense? You can see that process? It's very significant. Uh, great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious uh, land. Um, so, Students, Bible prophecy students who know Daniel 2, what nation follows Greece? 
It's Rome. So whatever this little power represents, it's taking on a new symbol, but it's representing Rome. And this new power starts out small, but grows to be what? Exceedingly great. So let's open our Bibles, and uh, let's, let's take a look at something here for a moment. Let's go to Daniel chapter 8. to see this, Daniel chapter 8. If you're there, say amen. Um, and I'm going to pick up, let's pick up in verse 9. We're going to go 9 through 12. It says, and out of one of them, the four winds. In fact, we can just pick up number 8. Uh, there, give us a little bit more background. Therefore, the male goat, goat, goat grew very great, but when he became strong, uh, the large horn was broken, Daniel, uh, um, Alexander dies. And in his place, four notable ones, his four generals, came up toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them, out of the winds, uh, came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, towards the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven. Wow, that's very interesting. And it cast down some of the hosts, some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. Let me pause there for a moment. Who's the prince of the host? Jesus. It's Christ. And it's very interesting, if you have a King James, and maybe even your new King James, the prince there, the P, is what? Is capitalized. So the scholars recognize that that represented uh, the deity. Okay? So he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices. Oh, wait a second. What are we talking about now? The sanctuary. All right? Remember we talked about that the one on earth was only a symbol of the one where? In heaven. So this power uh, would affect and impact the heavenly sanctuary. That's what the Bible is telling us. Uh, he would even exalt himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was what? Was cast down. So, so what we're seeing here is a power that would begin political, but it would end what? Religious. It would, it, it, the previous uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, doesn't do this. But this next power that represents Rome begins political and ends religious. You with me so far? Now, we're not going to flesh that out tonight, but in Lesson 15, we're going to spend the whole night on it. But I just want to whet your appetite there, because the Bible wants to bring this uh, to our attention. So what happens next? So we see Rome. Oh, I don't have the dates there for it. How did I miss that? Okay, so that's once, uh, 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. So you're looking at, this one lasts the longest, Rome does. Approximately 450 years. You with me so far? Very important. Not to miss that. Number four. Daniel was told that this little horn would defile the sanctuary. How long until it would be cleansed? And uh, Daniel 8.14 tells us, And he said unto me, unto what? 2,300 what? Days. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And we need to push pause here. So Daniel, the angel tells Daniel, for 2,300 uh, days, then the sanctuary should be cleansed. Now, if you do the math, and you do uh, 2,300 days, you end up with just a little less than seven years. So Daniel is giving this incredible sweep of history, okay? Does that cover just a little under seven years? Yeah. It doesn't. Because you've got, you know, Persia 200 years, Greece 140, Rome itself 150, and then you've got the, the time of the European nations. You are talking vast sweeps of time. It makes no sense if you make that leave a day. So now the question is asked, is there, in Bible prophecy, is, does a day represent something else? Let's take a look and see if it does. Let's open your Bibles, and let's take a look to the book of Ezekiel and see if Ezekiel has an answer for us. Remember, you have to let the Bible define itself. The Bible, what we're looking at right now is a code book. Uh, the, the prophecy is code. 
and it's cryptic. But the, the keys to answering uh, the, the riddles are found within the Bible. So God expects us to be students. You know, God is a smart teacher. Do you believe that? You know, how many of you when you were in school wanted the answers to everything? <laughs> and when in those rare moments when you did get them just handed to you, how well were you able to retain it? You, you couldn't remember it. It didn't remember. But when you had to study, and you had to hammer it out for yourself, isn't it funny how you're able to retain it? God is a wise teacher. He understands how the mind works. We need to study to make it stick. Does that make sense? And by the way, I've also found that when you share it with someone else, it helps it to stick too. Yeah. It helps it to stick. So, let's go to Ezekiel. And we're going to Ezekiel chapter 4. And I'm going to read verses 4 through 6. And of course, we're coming in the middle of a discussion. God is talking to his servant Ezekiel. And Ezekiel has a message for the people of God. And he wants to communicate something to him here. And so he says this to him. He says, Lie also on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days that you lie on it, you shall bear their iniquity. For I have <coughs> laid on you the years of their iniquity according to the number of their, what? Their days. 390 days, so you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side, then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel forty days. And I have laid on you a day for a each year. Oh. So in Bible prophecy, a day represents a year. Let's take a look and see if that's confirmed elsewhere. Let's go to the book of Numbers. So let's head back. Numbers uh, chapter 14. Fourteen, if you're there, say amen. amen. And I'm looking at verse 34. Uh, again, you remember this incident when the children of Israel sent spies into the land, spy out the land as they were approaching uh, Canaan. Do you remember how many days those spies were spying out the land? Forty, Forty days. Okay. But then you remember they came back and gave a bad report. They didn't have faith that God could conquer the land for them. And so in verse 34, judgment now comes down on Israel for their lack of faith. This is according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days. For each day you shall bear your iniquity one what? Year. Namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. And so remember, they had to wander in the wilderness how long? 40 years. So, is there a precedence for a day equaling a year in Bible prophecy? Students, what's the answer? The answer is yes. So now, if we say, instead of 200, uh, 2,300 days, you say 230 and 300 years, now the, the, the rise and fall of nations falls into this, this, this time frame. Does that make sense? Are, are we being good detectives? Is this making sense, students? All right, but we, so, so we know somewhere into the future of Daniel's, into Daniel's future, the judgment was going to be 2,300 years down the road. But where? Where does it begin? So, let's keep going. Uh, number five. How did Daniel respond? How did Daniel respond when he was told this? Uh, Daniel 8.27 says, And I, Daniel, what? Fainted and was sick for days. Afterward I rose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision but no one, what? Understood. Understood. By the way, I hope that you did your homework and you read Daniel 7, 8, and 9 before coming here because it'll make more sense. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm really moving fast. Uh, so Daniel faints. Daniel faints. You know, when Daniel arrives in Babylon with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, the textual evidence is that they were in their late teens. All right? Daniel now, by this juncture, is about 80 years old. And Daniel faints. Why did he faint? Because Daniel was getting ready. He knew that, that he had been praying for the people of God to return back to, to, uh, to their land of Israel. Them being in captivity was a disgrace to God. 
The reason they were there is because they had backslidden away from God. And the only, the last, God had to use an emergency measure to save the nation by allowing judgment to come upon them to bring them back to their senses. Isn't that a kind thing for God to do? It's an emergency plan to save them. By this point, if you remember, um, the, the northern tribe, the ten tribes to the north are gone. The Assyrians have taken them. All that's left is Judah and Benjamin, and they started in the, down the same path that the northern kingdom did, and so God let a judgment come upon them because their history had been one of continual uh, backsliding. And so Daniel was praying and looking forward to the time when God's people can return, and all of a sudden, this angel shows up and tells him about 2,300 days. Now Daniel knew prophecy. What do you think Daniel was thinking? We're going to be here a whole lot longer. And he was discouraged. But his discouragement uh, ends up changing. Open your Bibles. Let's take a look at Daniel chapter 9. Okay, you're, Dan you're there at Daniel chapter 9. All right, so Daniel is discouraged. We're going to be here a whole lot longer. So what does a good, discouraged Christian do, follower of God do? He studies his Bible. So that's what he does. Daniel 9, verse 22, it says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified of the Lord, given through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish what? Seventy years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Now it's very interesting. If you look at just a few verses up, Daniel 8.27, that's where Daniel faints. Do you see that? And then I, Daniel, what? Fainted. Two verses down, he's studying the book of Jeremiah. And he goes, wait a second. We're not going to be here in no 2,300 years. We're almost out of here. The prophecy said 70 years. We only have a few short years left. So then he said, then what in the world was that 2,300 year business about? So now, take a look at verse 23. So Daniel now begins praying. And uh, the prayer of Daniel, by the way, the whole chapter 9 is an amazing, humble prayer. As uh, he's confessing the sins of his nation and uh, asking God for forgiveness. And, at, and then he starts asking God to reveal to him, to help him understand the 2300 days. Uh, because the first part of the, of, the, of the vision, which Gabriel brought, which had to do with the animals, he got that. But when it came down to explain the 2300 days, before Gabriel can explain it, Daniel passes out. So now look at verse 23. It says, And at the beginning of your supplication, the angel's talking. Let me back up here. Let's, let's start in verse 20. Now while I was speaking, in, uh, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplications before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision, which vision? The vision in Daniel 8, right? At the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. So now Gabriel comes back to explain the vision. You know, by the way, this, this, this text is very interesting to me. Where is heaven? It's far away, isn't it? And, and you know, we, uh, we here on earth, we get pretty excited about traveling the speed of sound. In fact, we even talk about traveling the speed of light. This angel was traveling the speed of thought. While this man was in prayer, this angel was dispatched. And he was on the spot that fast. I think that's awesome. Don't you? That to me is absolutely amazing. So it, uh, Gabriel comes back. He already gave the answers to the first part of the dream that dealt with the rise and fall of nations. Now he's going to come to explain the 2300 days. And um, let's take a look at que uh, question number six. The next chapter, in the next chapter, the angel explains the prophecy in greater detail.
detail. How long was the time period not previously described in the vision? Daniel 9.24 says 70 weeks are what? Determined. Actually, I should have had determined highlighted. I, 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 I gypped you. I'll let you begin. What's the first two words? Oh, that sounds so weak. Let's try it again. Ah, that's a little better. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up uh, the vision and prophecy. This is really an amazing verse. It is so loaded. So the angel begins by saying, 70 weeks are determined for your people. Okay? And so uh, the 70, 70 weeks, remember we're going a day for a year, and you can do the math later, if you, unless you have your calculators. But uh, 70, you know, with seven days in a week, 70, you end up with 490 days. All right? 490 what? Years. And the word determined uh, is the word kathak uh, in, in the Hebrew. And kathak means to cut or to divide. Uh, cut, divide, or amputate. And what, what the angel is saying is of the 2,300 days or years, the first 490 deal specifically with your people. All right? So that's what I have here. And we're going we're gonna to flesh that out. The four, first 490 deals with your people. Remember that Israel was in Babylon because they had been unfaithful. So God is telling them, I'm going to send you back and I'm giving you 490 years for a specific mission. And the text tells us. It says, to finish transgression. You see, the whole plan of salvation was to free man from sin. God gave that message that, to Israel to share with the world. But instead they turned it into a club. <coughs> Wherein you're out, we're saved, you're lost. And, and they turned it into a club. By the way, can we do that as Christians? We can do that very easily, couldn't we? That's what Israel did. They turned it into a club. They weren't interested in reaching others. By the time Christ comes onto the scene, it was all about me and not about anybody else. But anyway, so they were to finish transgression, to make an end of what? To sin, to stop rebelling against God, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting what? Righteousness, to seal up division and prophecy. Their mission was to tell the world that the Messiah was coming. It was their work to, to introduce the Messiah when he came to the world. That was their job. That was their mission. And so God gave them a 490 year probationary period to trust him. To yield their lives to him. By the way, do you remember the story? Um when Peter asked Jesus, you know, uh, how many times should we forgive people? Three times or seven times? You know, the Jews taught three times. The, the Pharisees says, you got three times, like baseball. Three strikes, that's it. But, uh, and so, Peter, recognizing that Jesus is very merciful, and knowing that seven is a special number to the Lord, he said, seven times. Do you remember Jesus' answer? And when you do the math, what does that equal? Talking about God, how gracious God had been with the nation. Isn't that amazing? How gracious He had been with the nation. And uh, so they were given that probationary period um, to fulfill their mission to the world. And uh, so we're looking now at two, the, the 23 of the days is divided into two parts. One is going to deal with the uh, 490 years. And then, I didn't write this down, then we're going to touch on the remaining. How much is that? Is it 1810? Yeah. Yeah. 1810 remaining years. So it's divided into two segments. So let's keep going here. And we're on question number seven. What was the starting point for the 2300 day in a 70 week time prophecy? This is critical because without this, the prophecy doesn't make much sense to us. When does it begin? And the Bible tells us, Daniel 9 25. Know therefore and understand that from the what? The going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. 
So here it's talking about the decree going forth to restore and build Jerusalem. Now this is where you get the drink from the fire hydrant. Hang on. You get this data from the book of Ezekiel. In the book of Ezekiel, you're going to find three decrees. The first is from uh, Cyrus, when he sends Israel back. The second one, to build the temple. The second one comes from Darius, and now it's to, fin to, to, to complete it and, and, and complete the walls. The third one is Artaxerxes, and what Artaxerxes does is he gives the nation sovereignty. They can now uh, rule themselves, create their own judges. You have to use the three decrees, and the three decrees equal actually equal one decree because you have a, a complete whole to make the nation a nation. Open your Bibles. Let's turn to Ezekiel. I want you to see this. Because the Bible writer views it that way. They don't view it as three different decrees, but they view it as one decree. So we're looking at the book of Ezekiel comes before Nehemiah and Ezra. <coughs> Ezra, I'm sorry, I said Ezekiel, forgive me, Ezra. Did I say Ezekiel before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I only expect my wife to read my mind. <laughs> Not you all. Forgive me. Thank you for that correction. I am talking about the book of Ezra. By the way, if you really want to get into this, you want to study something fascinating, there's a book out called Ezra 7 by a man named Siegfried, Siegfried Horn. You have no idea the complexity of nailing this down because you're actually lining up calendars of various nations. And, uh, and it's fascinating to see how they did that to actually arrive at the starting point, which is the last of the three decrees that were given. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Ezra, and we're looking at chapter 6. You there? Why don't we begin at verse 4? Yeah, it's 14 is what we're looking for. It says, So the elders of the Jews built, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido. And they built and finished it according to the commandment of the goddess of Israel, and according to the what? Command. Is that plural or singular? It's singular. The command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, King of Persia. So, so the Bible writer recognizes that it's the three decrees that make uh, uh, the nation of Israel be a nation again. You need all three. And the Bible writer recognizes the three as one command. Are you with me? So you get the starting point from the last of the three decrees. And when you do that, you, end, you get your starting point is 457. Archaeologist uh, Siegfried Horn was able to get that for us. So how do we know that's accurate? Well, we'll know it's accurate because everything else that follows has to line up the main events in Bible prophecy. And let's see if it does that. The proof will be in the pudding. Any questions at this juncture? Okay. So the decree to rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince is going to be how many years? Okay, so what this is telling us is that the Old Testament followers of Christ were actually given a prophecy to tell them when the Messiah would begin his ministry, his mission. Do you realize that? When Jesus arrives in Bethlehem, nobody was paying attention. Even though God had, had already given them the prophecy indicated, they weren't paying attention. We need to keep that in the back of our minds because we're going to find as we go along that God has given to the Christian church signs of His coming. And as the devil fooled the people of God in the Old Testament, He's working to fool them in the New Testament too. Does that make sense? We need to be awake. People back then were not. So God actually told them, okay, where am I next? So we know we're looking at 2,300 years and the starting point is 457 and we're going to start fleshing out all this stuff here in the middle. So question number um, eight. Uh, before I go any further. So the starting point is 457. We have 69 weeks, which equals 483 years. 
And that brings us to Messiah the Prince. And if you do the math, that equals AD 27. Now, um, many times Bible scholars, many of them are kind of in different places as to the time in which Jesus began his ministry. Um, this is your most consistent number, but it lines up with the 457, which the archaeologists are telling us is when the decree began to the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Are you with me? So far. Let's see what else lines up. All right. Take a look at question number eight. We're there. The angel said that if you count 69 weeks from 457 BC, you will come to Messiah the Prince. Did that happen? And this is so exciting for me. Dan, did you, there, there are things that are said in Scripture that don't seem to make much sense. This is one of those that, that I had a big aha moment when I saw this. Um, Acts 10, 37, and 38 says, That word you know, after the baptism which John preached, how God did what? Anointed, that means the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. So this is when Jesus begins his ministry with John the Baptist, baptizing, right? Open your Bible to Mark chapter 1. Watch this. Mark chapter 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. Mark chapter 1. And uh, we're looking at verses, begin with verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is what? <coughs> Fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. What time is fulfilled? The prophecy. The prophecy stating that the Messiah would come at, uh, 483 years after uh, the, the beginning of the, 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 the building of Jerusalem. And Jesus, in the beginning of his ministry, is announcing to everyone the prophecy is fulfilled. The time has come. You are now being presented the gospel. Is that not amazing? Oh, I think you all need a little bit of my enthusiasm. Okay, so let's take a look here at some of the math. Now, one thing we need to realize if you're going to, this is something that doesn't concern us because we're so far beyond the transition of BC to AD. But when you're, when you're counting down, if you're going to be doing the math on this, if you're, when you're counting down from BC, which is before Christ, AD, uh, Anno, Domini, uh, which is uh, the year of our Lord, you've got to go 4, 3, 2, 1. There is no zero. And we tend to think there should be one. There isn't one. It goes four, three, two, one, one. One is counted twice. Then you start going up. Does that make sense? Okay. Because if you start doing the math, you're, that zero is going to mess you up if you stick it in there. You're going to be a one year off. Um, so, uh, 483, 457 beginning date, lands you at AD 26, and we one year for the BC AD, which lands you at AD 27. That was another drink out of the fire hydrant. Does that make sense? I hope so. You're all quiet when I asked if that makes sense. But uh, you've got to be able to recognize that transition. It's very, very important. All right, number nine. So the, the, last, the next thing we need to do is we have a week of time left. All right, so we're, we're at the starting point. We have one week of time left to round out the 490 years. 70 weeks, which equals 490. Number nine. What was to take place next in the prophecy? <clears throat> Daniel 9, 26, 27 says, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be what? Cut off, but not for himself. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifices and offering. This one's really significant. It's saying that in the middle of the last week, in the middle of this last week, and if you go in the middle, what's, if you have a week and you're going to divide it in half, how many days is that? 
Three and, and, three and a half. By the way, how many years was Christ's ministry? Three and, three and, and, and a half. Three and a half. So right in the middle of that last week of time, something's going to happen that's going to result uh, in the end of the activities of the sanctuary. In other words, it's going to um, uh, bring an end to the significance of the sanctuary. So what happens in the middle of that last week? Christ is crucified, right? His ministry was three and a half years and then he is crucified. Something else happens then at the last part of, um, of that week. I want to show you something that's very interesting. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 15. So you remember, remember we studied that when Jesus died on, the, on Passover, he actually died at the very time when the Passover lamb was supposed to be killed. Right, right down to the hour. Okay? And uh, we're going to look at something here that's very, very interesting that really ties in to Daniel's prophecy. Because the prophecy said that the sacrifices and offerings would come to an end. And in uh, Mark chapter 15, I'm reading verse 37 and 38. It says, And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was what? torn in two from top to bottom. So, the moment Jesus dies, the temple curtain, okay, that divides the holy from the most holy, is ripped in half. Josephus, the historian, writes about that. And he says that the very moment that the priest was going to take the life of the lamb, he hears and when he turns, he cries out Ichabod, by the way, which means the presence of God is left. And, and, and the thing is torn in half. And so, and then the historian Josephus tells us that the Lamb, what? They ran away. Why? Because the Lamb of God had been given. The reason why the sacrificial system ends is because the real sacrifice was given. You know, uh, I, I don't follow sports anymore, but this is a simple illustration. But when teams are getting ready to play the Super Bowl, what do they do in the days leading up to the Super Bowl? What are the teams doing? They're practicing. But on the day of the Super Bowl, do they practice? No, it's the real deal now. And so the sanctuary service was to help Israel practice what they were to do with the Messiah when he came, to understand what he was going to do and, and to bring them to faith. But when he came, you no longer practice. The sacrificial system came to an end. The ones who didn't believe continue. Who didn't accept him as the Messiah. And it's very interesting because Paul... Let's go to Hebrews. <clears throat> Give me a moment here to find this. Hebrews, and we're going to go... I think it's 8 or 9. It's 9. And Paul here is talking about the Day of Atonement. And let's, uh, let's pick up at verse 8, okay? Of 9, it says, The Holy Spirit indicates that this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. So he's talking about the one in heaven. And what he's saying here is, uh, is that the sanctuary in heaven was not open for business while the one on earth was open for business. Did you catch that? Let me read it again. Well, the, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. The, the, it, the first one, it was what? It was what? Symbolic. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifice are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience. Did the death of animals take away the sin of people? No. No. And that's what Paul was saying. The one on earth was only symbolic. Okay, But it pointed to the Lamb of God that would come to take away the sin of the world. It's only the blood of Jesus that washes away sin, not the blood of animals. But it was to help them come to faith to look forward to the coming of the Messiah. Now you and I look back to the cross. They were looking forward to the cross by faith. We look back by faith. All right, And, and so what Paul is saying is that while the, sacri while the sanctuary system on earth was on operation, the one in heaven wasn't. Because the sacrifice hadn't been given yet. 
Jesus is both sacrifice and priest. And when Jesus gives his life, he becomes a sacrifice. Resurrection morning, where does he go? To heaven. For what purpose? To make sure it was good. To make sure it was good. And then what? He anointed. He, he anoints the, the sanctuary is anointed and goes into business. And now when John, in on the island of Patmos, is praying, where does he find Jesus? In the holy place. Right next to the, the, the seven seed candlestick. Are you with me? So Jesus now is in heaven ministering. The one on earth is no longer. I share this with you because there's a lot of people that are looking at, at the sanctuary in Israel and they're waiting for something to happen for the sacrificial system to begin again. Listen, friend, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, don't be looking at Israel. Look to heaven. Amen. Does that make sense? You've got to look to heaven uh, because the sacrifice is here. Now, it's said that he would be cut off. What does that exactly mean? Let's take a look in the book of Isaiah. And we're going to look at chapter 53. And chapter 53 of Isaiah is the chapter that really describes the mission of Christ. It is the most clear description of Jesus and his mission. By the way, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but in the Jewish culture, this is a forbidden chapter of the scriptures to read. They are forbidden to read this chapter. Uh, the reason being is because it is so evident, it so points to Jesus of Nazareth as being the Messiah. There is a, a writer, you ought to read his book, his name is Joseph Wolf. And how many of you have ever heard of Joseph Wolf? Just a couple of you. Joseph Wolf was a, a Jewish convert to Christianity uh, back in the late 1800s. This guy's story is amazing. This guy was like a modern Paul. But his father uh, was in charge of the synagogue in his community. And one day as the boy was walking home, he listens. He goes by a Christian church and hears the singing. And then he, he's caught by the singing and then he hears the preaching. And he's just outside listening. And an elderly man, after the service, sees the young boy and challenges him to go home and read Isaiah 53. So he does. And then he goes to his father and he says, Dad? Who is this describing? And his dad looks at him very coldly. And you know, with kids, when you tell them, don't do this, sometimes. At age 11, he gave his life to the Lord, and he was kicked out of his house at age 11. But he became an incredible missionary for God. He went all over the world. His adventures are outrageous. But if you want to read an amazing biography, Joseph Wolf, I encourage you to read it. But anyway, Isaiah 53... And we're going to see, let the Bible define this word cut off for us. Let's take a look at verse... Hmm. Why don't we pick up a verse 7? It says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears, he is silent. So he opened not, he did, he opened not his mouth. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was... Cut off from the land of the living. Why? For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. Remember, it wasn't for himself, the text tells us. It was for you and me, friends, because you and I need a Savior. So in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he is cut off. He, his life comes to an end. So let's continue. I guess we have... Uh, so now we have come to AD 31. We still have to go the other three and a half years. Let's take a look at question number 10. Jesus told his disciples to preach first to which group of people? Uh, Matthew 10, 5, and 6. It says, don't go into the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus gives instructions to his disciples. This is, this is very important. We're going to pull this together. And he tells them, look, before sending the gospel to the world, go first where? To Israel. By the way, as we as Christians, this is a good instruction for us. We need to remember that in the gospel, it begins first in our hearts. Is that right? We begin with those closest to us, then we work our way out. But that was the instruction that God gave to Israel. Let's uh, pick up in uh, the note right below 10. Uh, read along with me as I read aloud. It says, Jesus insisted that his disciples preach first to the Jews because they still had three and a half years remaining of their 490-year opportunity to accept and proclaim the Messiah. The prophecy of Daniel 9.27 said that Jesus would confirm the covenant 
by the great plan of salvation with many for one prophetic week, which seven literal years. But Jesus was crucified in the midst of that final week, allotted to his chosen nation. So how could he confirm the covenant with them after his death? The answer is found in Hebrews 2, 3 that says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at, at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Jesus' disciples preached to the Jews for that final three and a half years until the nation officially rejected the gospel message in A.D. 34 when Stephen, a righteous deacon, was publicly what? Let's take a look at that incident. Open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. Excuse me, Acts. Acts chapter 7. <clears throat> Stephen was a champion of the early church. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Stephen, when he'd go into the synagogues and the, the Jewish leaders would try to prove him wrong, he would, he would argue them right under the table. The brother knew his scriptures. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit. He had a gentle nature. He was not an argumentative person. But his arguments were so conclusive that they were, he, they, he frustrated the opposition. So what they do? If you can't beat them, you kill them. <laughs> they took him uh, to... Uh, the council, uh, which is the Supreme Court of Israel, the Sanhedrin, uh, to try him. And verse 7, you, you have his, you know, they, they accuse him of all kinds of crazy stuff. Finally, they give him an opportunity to speak, and he begins to give a history of Israel, mm -hmm. of the nation, and their continual unfaithfulness to God. The rise and fall, the God forgives them, they come back, then they go into deeper apostasy. And uh, as he's going along, the nation, the, the, he has his group, uh, his audience completely captivated. And there comes a point that they don't want to hear anymore because they're starting to put numbers together. They're starting to add it up and they're beginning to realize that they have done the same thing that their fathers have done in the past. And they don't want to hear it. So watch what happens in verse 54. It says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. By the way... Cut to the heart is an expression. They came under conviction. They were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. That's not a good sign. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, what? Standing. Isn't that interesting? We're going we're to revisit that. Standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open. And the Son of Man standing, that's twice now, mentions it, at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and they stopped their ears. And ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their cloth, their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down, cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. They killed him. But look at the next verse. So now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great what? Persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all what? Scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So remember Jesus said, first begin where? In Jerusalem. Right? But then, for three and a half more years, they still had three and a half more years before the 490 were up. But in AD 34, they stoned Stephen. The persecution began, and the gospel went everywhere. Exactly as God had prophesied. I want to go back to the standing bill. You know, the Bible says that when Jesus went to heaven, he is now located where? The right hand of God, how? Sitting. Sitting. But twice, in this instant, he's standing. And you would think that if that wasn't important, it wouldn't be mentioned twice. So what was God trying to tell us? Take a look at Isaiah 3.
This is amazing. Are you there? Isaiah 3, if you're there, say amen. If you need more time, mercy. All right, we're going to look, and you might want to get your pencil ready because you want to highlight this verse. This is very interesting. Isaiah 3, verse 13. The Lord, what? Stands up to plead and stands to what? Judge the people. What that should have indicated to the people who knew their scriptures is that the 490 probationary period had come the nation of Israel was rejected as the visible representative of God. And now, that representation is going to go to somebody else. Now, that doesn't mean that the probation for the people of Israel had closed. Each one still has the opportunity to make a choice. And we know that the early church was mostly made up of Jews. <coughs> so it's not rejecting the Jews. It just rejects the nation as being the visible representative. But now, that honor goes to another. Now, let's take a look at verse 11. Oh, verse 10. Uh, is it 10? No, 11. Sorry. It says, uh, What warning did Jesus give to his chosen people? Matthew 21 and 43 says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be what? Taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. So it, that honor now, being the visible representative of God, goes to someone else. Let's take a look at question uh, number 12. So what is the other, quotes nation spoken of by Jesus in Matthew 21, 43, which would become his chosen people? Galatians 3, 9 says, So then those who are of what? Of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Romans 2, 28 and 29 says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, but he is a Jew who is one what? Inwardly. It's not by genetics. It's not by birth. It's by faith. All right? And now... When we take a look at 1 Peter 2.9, as he's speaking to the church, the New Testament church, he says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal what? Priesthood. A holy what? Amen. Nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Now that mission, the visible representatives of God is the Christian church. That means that Israel's mission, that used to be their mission, is now our mission. We have got to warn the world that the Messiah is about to return. That is now our mission. We have to let people know Christ is about to return. And we cannot turn the church into a club like Israel turned their deal into a club. Are you with me? We have a work to do. There are people out there that are dying to know what you and I know. We have got to share it. Or their blood will be on our hands, friends. And number 13. According to the angel who spoke with Daniel, what will happen at the end of the 2300 years? Daniel 8.14 says, And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. My friends, that takes us to the year 1844. The Bible is telling us that the judgment is going to begin in 1844, which is now past for us. So let's take a look at the note uh, right below number 13. It says, in 1834, there remained 1810 years of the 2300 day prophecy left. Study the diagram below or up here and notice the dates. Adding 1810 years to 8034 brings us to the autumn of 1844. The angel said that at that time the heavenly sanctuary would be cleansed. The earthly sanctuary was destroyed in 8070. Jesus, I our priest in heaven, began removing the record of sin from the heavenly sanctuary. Now what we're going to learn in our next presentation, and then we're going to flesh it out, is that the judgment comes in three parts, three phases. So the first part began in 1844. We're going to take a look at what that, what that is. Later, in study number 17, we're going to find out that as the sanctuary in heaven began to be cleansed, something began to happen on earth. We're going to study that in lesson 17. And then in study number 18, we're going to study the second coming of Jesus Christ. Um, now let's take a look at question number... But before we do that, open your Bibles to Revelation 22. 
You know, a lot of people say today that the judgment takes place after we die or it takes place after Jesus returns, but that doesn't jive with Scripture. Well, for one, it doesn't jive with this prophecy, but it doesn't jive with something Jesus told us. Revelation 22. If you're there, say amen. amen. Revelation 22, and uh, looking at verse 12. Jesus says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my what? Reward. Reward is with me to give to how many people? Everyone. Everyone according to his work. When Jesus comes, he gives his rewards to everybody. How can he give his rewards to everybody if there haven't been a judgment yet? There has to be a judgment first. Does that make sense? The text tells us that. It's logical. And the prophecy bears it out. Um, so, we have, we have covered a lot of ground, haven't we? Did you feel that you take a drink out of a, three, out of a fire hydrant? Bless your heart. You know, when I first uh, studied this, many years ago, at First Union Mortgage Corporation, I was an employee there, and this gal that I did the, the, the funeral for her husband, she was, the, she was one of the people in the study who later embraced what we're studying and gave her life to Christ. And so she, I was just a new Christian, so she was the very first person I led to the Lord. Are you with me? So she, I have a very special bond with this gal. And uh, anyway, we studied Daniel Revelation and we did it over a period of two and a half years <coughs> as a group. We went verse by verse, word by word. It was amazing. The things that word that, that you just took a drink out of a fire hydrant with, we did all that in about two and a half years. It was amazing. Uh, and the detail that we were able uh, to do, but that was a, a tremendous uh, experience appearing in our life. Let's round this off in the 14th. Whose cases are being considered in the pre-advent judgment? 1 Peter 4.17 says judgment begins where? It begins at house of God. Why? First, because remember, you have to confess your, your sin on the Lamb, then it's transferred to the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement, it's removed. So it only begins with those who have accepted Christ as their Savior. Because the others who haven't are already condemned. I'll prove it to you. Go to John, chapter 3. <coughs> and this is a, a book that we're all very familiar with. Uh, and a verse that people who really are unchurched. They've heard this verse, and they probably can repeat it by memory. If you're there, John chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. Now we've got to do a Paul Harvey and look at the rest of the story. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. Saved. Now, verse 18 is the key. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is what? Condemned, condemned already. The only way out of condemnation is through Jesus Christ. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So those who have not accepted Jesus as their Savior are not part of the first part of the judgment. It only deals with the house of God. Those who claim that they've given their lives to Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Okay. And let's look at the note right below that. Thus, since 1844, Jesus has been conducting the final phase of his ministry as taught in the ancient Jewish sanctuary, his work of final judgment. In our next study, we will look deeper into the Bible to learn what the judgment is all about. Remember, while Jesus conducts the judgment, he still intercedes for you and me. He continues the work of mediation even while he conducts the final judgment. Praise God. Our high priest is not only our judge, he is also our intercessor. He stands for us. And so we're going to learn some amazing things in our next presentation. And, and to me, that is so fascinating because the judgment reveals the character of God. How is God handling the judgment? Very significant. So this is your opportunity to respond. Are you glad that God has provided the sanctuary truth so we might know what Jesus is doing for us right now in the heavenly sanctuary? What's your answer? Yes. Absolutely. Amen. I am so glad. God, is, God wants me to be aware of what he's doing. He wants us all to. He wants us to. Uh, I kept you over a little bit this time. My apologies for that. I think I had a big intro. <coughs> but let's close out with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are studying things that 
that, that are so incredibly relevant to where we are right now in Earth's history. Things that the whole world is, it needs to hear. So Lord, I pray that we, we covered a lot of information here tonight, and we just trust that your spirit, I trust your spirit was here, and uh, was translating all this into the minds and hearts of each one. Lord, we know that the hour is approaching. Help us to be attentive. Father, you called us to these meetings for this very reason, and we thank you for it. So Lord, please, uh, we ask now that you be with us as we travel home. Grant us your traveling mercies. We thank you, we love you, and we praise you. As we ask it all in Jesus' precious name, amen. amen.